So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Kyle Berkeley. Dr. Berkeley is a husband and father from Baltimore, Maryland. After graduating from Frederick Douglass High School, Kyle attended Coppin State College with a major in history. After completing, after attending Coppin State, he worked for the Maryland Department of Corrections for five years as a correctional officer. Kyle would later continue his education at Sojourner Douglas College and Morgan State University, where he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in social work. Kyle also earned a master's degree in philosophy and a PhD in human and social services from Walden University. In 2012, Kyle and his wife, Rebecca, created a nonprofit organization called the For Us Initiative that provides safe housing for victims of domestic violence, homeless families, and preventive care for adolescents. In 2014, Kyle was elected as a representative to the Baltimore City State Central Committee. Along with serving on the Central Committee, Kyle has provided mental health therapy, grief counseling, and case management at Baltimore City shelters, hospitals, transitional homes, and many other locations. Dr. Vibe has become Canada's prince of podcasts. He dominates the internet when it comes to hosting intelligent, entertaining conversations on race and gender. His experience as a TV reporter injects an extra dose of thoughtfulness into all of his interviews, setting him apart from the average online broadcaster. He brings that same professionalism and insight to all of his online conversations across numerous platforms. He is the host and producer of his own online show, The Dr. Vibe Show. His main mission is to peel back the layers of the mainstream media's construct around black males to reveal the positivity that is often clouded. And I see Clarence McNair is... Corinthia, can I just add one more thing to the intro? Absolutely. Well, I just want to add, and first of all, thanks again for having me here. I am the host of the only online show in the world for dads and fathers. It's sponsored by Dove Men Care. It's also co-sponsored by Canada's national fatherhood organization called Dad Central. And through that collaboration, I've been able to reach out directly or indirectly to over 75 dads and fathers around the world this year. Wonderful. Thank you. You're very welcome. And our next panelist, known from singing in male R&B group, the R&B group Prophet Jones, Clarence K.D. McNair, has returned to the spotlight as a best-selling author of two books, Give It One More Try, and why, actually it's three now, but in this it says, Why Happiness is the Way to Go. Dedicated to all of the overcomers in the world, McNair shifts his reader's mind from that one negative thought seeking to alter one's life. He shares the different experiences he encountered while, while working as a national recording artist and how he improved from his anxiety disorders after losing his record label, record label deal. For years, McNair suffered greatly from panic attacks and other difficulties. And in his book, he shares his road to recovery and how changing his perspective led to a restored way of living. And Mr. McNair and I share something in common. We're both from the east side of Baltimore. <laughs> so, be more. That's right, be more east side. <laughs> So with oh. that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Berkeley, who will facilitate this conversation. Well, good afternoon again. Good afternoon again. Um, welcome to our panelists and welcome to our viewers. Uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to jump into what are your thoughts and your views on depression and anxiety dealing with this pandemic that we've been in? 
Well, if I'm uh, if I'm allowed to, I'm going to start off with a quote, and I think it's very yeah, fitting. Sure. Um, it's from poet Prentice Powell, and it was uh, following the Michael Brown shooting in 2014. But I still think it's relevant today. And it's a very interesting quote. Being a black man in America, and I'm going to say North America because I'm in Canada. Being a black man in North America means being my brother's keeper. Being a black man in North America means being my brother's keeper keeper while keeping a distance from my brother because I don't trust him further than I can see him. It's believing the cops don't care about you. It's believing how not to doubt yourself because when you're born, everyone else does. So just to add to the, your question or responding to your question, I think uh, the pandemic, the inequalities, especially for black men, because we're talking about black men, has grown wider. Uh -huh. And the challenges that were there in the past have only heightened and great, great, become greater. Now, there are many black men that have, you know, communicated and bonded. But now the thing is, they, they've expressed they want help. It's now, where can they get help? I like her. Clarence, go ahead. Hey, what's up, guys? Just want to make sure. Can you guys hear me loud and clear? Yes, sir. In terms of just like the whole pandemic as a whole, <clears throat> I think it was the first time in a long time that the entire world had an opportunity to sit still. If you look at what took place in the pandemic, a lot of issues came to the front. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues that has been happening and existing for years. And during the pandemic, every single topic, issue, concern, got the attention that is never received. People were, we had restrictions in the beginning of the pandemic. We could not go out to the restaurants. We could not really interact with family. And we were glued to CNN and YouTube and all these social media platforms. I feel like when you speak about uh, black men in America or just America as a whole, I feel like we are in a time where we have moved forward because of the pandemic people were more in touch with social problems. So my perspective on the pandemic that the pandemic did our community a lot of good because it addressed a lot of issues that existed for a long time. And even when you look at George Floyd, you look at a couple of other issues, let's say had those incidents took place three years ago, I feel that it would have been swept under the rug. With social media having the entire world's attention, with us waiting to see what the next thing that was going to happen with COVID, I felt like the attention that these uh, problems received helped contribute to America and our government higher ups and people who are in charge, they were forced to go back and fix some things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole entire world, we came together we witnessed change, even with some of the old statues coming down, you know, some of the local changes for us as a culture, as a whole, I just feel like the pandemic was the start of new beginnings. Yeah. And we're definitely going to touch some more on the George Floyd thing. I'm glad you brought it up because I do have it um, on the flow of how we're going to go. So I'm glad you brought that up early, but I, I want to go back to Dr. Vibe for a second. Cause he said, uh, won't help, but where can we get help? And one thing that stood out to me was representation. And in the healthcare field, and especially in the mental health uh, field, there's a gap that I'm starting to notice. And I actually started working on a study related to this, related to Black male therapists. Um, myself being one, I've been working in this field since 2008, 2009. And in my career, I've come across four, four practicing fully licensed social workers. And, and that's alarming. Uh, I went as far as to ask one of the people who's a head up at, um, in Arado County and in uh, their crisis department, how many fully licensed male um, African-American social workers have they ever had there? And their answer was zero. So I was like, well, how long have you been running this department? And they tell me since 2001. I'm like, excuse me, is that is that real? And and it's kind of alarming when you look around. So 
I get a lot of referrals uh, where I do private practice at, right? And I get a lot of referrals. And the first thing that they look for is they look for black male therapists, marriage counseling, um, adolescents dealing with issues, um, whatever have you. They, they, that's the first thing they look for. And it's like a huge question mark, like, why is it that there aren't that many African-American male therapists with the LCSWC? We might have an LM, but we're not able to do private practice and bill insurance. And sorry. Can I I I'm not a professional psychiatrist. I'm, I have a, an amazing gift to, mm -hmm. of understanding life. And I, I'm an artist. So it's the creative guy. In my, my opinion it was not something growing up. I grew up in East Baltimore mm -hmm. and in my community, first and foremost, no one ever talked about a therapist. Mm -hmm. Let's start right there before we can even get to if it's one or two or three or four males in the psychology world. Mm -hmm. It was not a conversation it was never brought up. So mm -hmm. us being guys, the conversations that I know I would have with my uncles were sports and working out and just being tough and and dealing with your problems being strong and I just feel like it just was never offered it wasn't a, a something that was brought up and there was not there was never value placed on it yeah that's my that's my perspective it was just not a value I feel like now we've seen so much uh, destruction from mental health problems, people going years with untreated mental health problems. I feel like now we have an emotional connection to our communities, to our family and us as men, we, because we have so many resources now, when, when I'm 43, when I was coming up, you didn't have YouTube. We didn't have social media so that you can see uh, conversations and interviews with people like Charlemagne and different individuals that jumped in front of mental health. I also mm -hmm. felt like uh, it was something that just kind of made you look weak as a guy. if You could not handle your problem. So why would you want to go in front of somebody else and try to help them resolve their problems where you were just told to tough it up? So I feel like now we're more in touch with our emotional side because growing up, Man, we weren't allowed to cry and, and connect with people emotionally. And we had to be tough guys. And so I feel like during this time that we're in, us as men, we are more in touch with our emotions. And we understand that it's going to take more than just being a tough guy to fix the problems. And we've realized that those old philosophies never worked. And because of the resources that's made available now more brothers like yourself going to college, getting education and uh, wanting to figure out some of these mysteries, I call them, of why. So that's, that's my opinion on why it's not so many guys like yourself. Well, I, if I just want to add on to the conversation, a myriad of things are running on in my alleged mind here, <laughs> that uh, there's so many things. Let's, let's put it this way, let's be real. How many services out there are for men, period? Very minimal. Right. Before the pandemic, I worked at Canada's only, only father-focused family center. So we have 30 million people in Canada. There wow. was one father family focus center in Canada. So let that simmer for a bit. Whenever I go out and share my heart, my passion for men and fathers, most of the audience are women and they get it. But the thing is, hold on here. Sorry about that. That's okay. Where, you know, where, where are the guys? Many guys, there are many men out there that are screaming and nothing's coming out. Mm -hmm. In North America, 80% of the suicides committed by people over 40 are by men. And many of those men look like us. So I agree with my brother that there's more out there, but sometimes there's so much out there. And for many men, they're just trying to get survive each day. They're just trying to get by the day. So yes, there's a lot of information out there, but it's a, a responsibility for us 
as brothers, there's an old song by the Doobie Rose. We got to take it to the streets, whether it's the digital streets, whether it's the face to face streets, because for a lot of black men, this pandemic has wiped them out. Totally wiped yeah. them out. And the thing is, this is my opinion. People may push back when you wipe out the black men, you wipe out the black family. Definitely. Sure. That's true. Right. Studies show that we are the most engaged with our children than any other man, no matter what background. So we, this is a fight for the family. It's not just a fight for men. It's a fight for the black family. And, and just adding to what you just mentioned, as you say, digital streets, having these kind of discussions. Mm -hmm. without, Absolutely. Without open discussions, there's no solution. No. And no. I feel like this is our contribution. This is our contribution to work towards creating change. Having I, I just, these discussions. Go just, I just want to bring up a conversation I had before the, the pandemic hit many years ago. I was invited to an, I was, I facilitated an event called Minding Our Minds. And it was for black fathers and mental health. Two days before the event, I only had three registrations. Guess how many black fathers showed up that night? Take a guess. Five. Five. 40. Wow. So, I had my flip chart already, etc. And a higher power in my life is God said, ask this question of the men, ask them how many of them had or have a good relationship with their father. Two hands went up. Oh, definitely. So right there, right there, that's a whole conversation itself. That's mm -hmm. part of the mental health challenge that many black men have let alone if they had a father there let alone if they had a good relationship with that father because most of us if we had a father a lot of times we emulate we emulate and we duplicate and you let me i mean i want to share something if i got a, a second yeah when I, when i first signed with uh, the record company i was signed to motown records and coming right out of east baltimore and when I look back over a lot of decisions that I made from being on a Jamie Foxx movie soundtrack and all of these amazing things and work with some amazingly creative people and been in a really cool position. One of the challenges that I had is I had no mentor. I had no one to look up to, no one to give me any advice. And the first person that should give you advice is your father because <laughs> they're older. It's, they don't have to know the business that you're in. They could use some, some life wisdom. So mm -hmm. being young, I'm 19, I'm living in LA, I'm, I'm traveling the world, I'm on television, I'm doing all of these things and never being able to have someone to call and say, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, so even though we had the money and had the fame, a million bad decisions were made, not because I was a bad person, it's because I could not pick up the phone and get some kind of advice that would help me. And, and if had I had that, a lot of things would have been different. So what he's saying in terms of when the two guys raised their hand and said, we're the only people that had a relationship without that, he's 100% right. Because mm -hmm. not, just, not just when you're talking mental health, when you're talking just life in general, if you cannot reach out to someone that you trust, because that's another big issue that we have. No one trusts anyone. You right. also, if there's no one you can trust, you should be able to trust your parents because they were the people who brought you into this world. So when you grow up without having those, that solid foundation, you already lack, you already, whether you believe it or not, you have trust issues because the mm -hmm. person who was supposed to be your hero was not there. So now you have to rely on all of these other people and build trust through all these strangers and not saying that this is the reason why. That's why you find a lot of our young men in games. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, some of these game guys, they take on the, the, the form of a father. 
that they never had. And, and family. And family. Yeah. So when we, there's a cause and effect. There's a reason for everything. It, it, things just don't happen. There's a reason for everything. So you 100% right. It's just like having uh, a father around and, and, and us trying to move forward. Unfortunately, it's been challenging because when you don't have that foundation and in, in that background, I mean, it, I mean, the backbone, like your confidence, we dealing with confidence issues too in yeah. the community. Kyle, I could go on, but I, I want, I know you've got some questions you want to ask, so I'll keep my, I'll no, keep my piece. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you, we're kind of going right on par because we're okay. going right into the stigma as far as African American men with uh, mental illness and with health, especially well, during thing, this pandemic. And we're like right at par. Yeah, because again, men, generalization, many men don't like to ask for help. Mm -hmm. No. And then, especially when it comes to mental health, oh gosh. That's even a deeper, that's even a higher pole to climb. So yeah. especially in the African diaspora, if you ask for help and you're a guy, it's getting better, but it's not close to where it's no. supposed to be. No. In my, in my book, Give It One More Try, I, I wrote a chapter that talked about help being cool. Help being cool. And uh, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, no one asks for help people and that's a problem that that right there creates so many internal problems when you just hold every single thing in and you fight these wars from within yourself and then that turns into another problem and then it's just keep going on and on and on and on so we definitely need to while we have this platform right here I know I want to say this I don't know if this will be shared or not if you're watching this conference, this conversation, I just want to let you know that everyone is going through something. Even us people on this panel, we have our own challenges mm -hmm. and you're not in this alone. A lot of times people feel alone. People feel that, well, wait a minute, I have problems, but some kind of way we convince ourselves that we're the only person on, on this planet who is dealing with that issue as if that one issue there's nobody else in the world who can relate to it so people start to convince themselves that i'm alone so i'm if anyone is watching this uh platform just know that you're not alone you have great brothers like the brothers that's on the line and 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 uh other resources out there so i always like to say that because you just never know where this content is going to surface at so one person could look at this conversation and just hear one little piece of a message and it could be life changing, especially now with so much change going on in the world all at one time. And you have people losing their jobs. You have people trying to figure out how they're going to take care of their family. When you talk about the black community, uh, especially us as black men, it's always been a challenge and a struggle before the pandemic. Now you have this pandemic and you have people who, are being forced to make some serious decisions. People who, let's keep it real. If you wanna keep it real, let's keep it real. People who may not even have reserves, financial reserves. When you talk about, you can't talk about men in the pandemic without talking about finances. So a lot of people were not prepared for this pandemic, for these restrictions, for having to make a decision. Okay, do I, I gotta stay on my job, I have to, they changing the rules at the job and dealing yeah. with the dynamics of the family. It's just so much stress at this time that when I got the call to be a part of this panel, I was like, okay, yes, let's make this happen because people just need to hear these conversations and, and get some kind of answers and, and know that help is out. There. Yeah. I'll, I'll piggyback on with that because about a week ago, I hosted a, co -hosted a conversation for the Black environment here in Toronto called To Vax or Not To Vax. And just piggyback on what Clarence has said, some people are being asked to make some pretty significant decisions uh -huh. in regards to, and I know a brother who works for the city of Toronto because of allergies, sy symptoms and all this stuff. He's 
you know, the city of Toronto doesn't believe him. He's got to get medical proof. But right now, he's lost his job. Uh-huh. Yes. He's lost he's his a- job, right? And again, pilot on to the image of being a provider and your man supposed to be a provider. The challenges that we already face as a Black man, racism, economic stress, uh, just trying to get by each day. And then you have this pile- thing piled on to you. The easiest thing for a lot of men these days is to quit. Oh my goodness. To it, quit. And like, uh, it's just too much. They're just saying, I, I, I'm just checking out. I'm, I'm done. Like, and, and quitting can take so many different end results. Yes. Quitting taking their own life, quitting leaving their family, quitting on themselves, quitting on this, quitting on that, quitting out and maybe doing some negative things in society. Yes, yeah. it, it, quitting. It's, it's, I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because you nailed it. He did. And that is so true. Um, this book title, Give It One More Try. I, the reason why my book was titled that is because during a really challenging part of my life, transitioning from the music industry and losing a record deal, it took so much inside of me. So I can only imagine people who were already going through challenges. Now the whole world is changing right in front of our face and people are being forced to make life or death decisions. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, let's keep it real. Everybody in this world is not motivated. Everyone in this world have not found their purpose. Everyone in this world does not have a side job, a side business, money saved up in the bank. So when the per- when you go into work and you got a family to provide for and they telling you, well, if you don't do this, you won't have a job. That's a life or death decision. Mm-hmm. I'm going through that now with one of my friends. So she doesn't believe in uh, any form of vaccinations, which is fine. Everybody has their own per- perspective, right? Uh, and her oldest son is an engineer. So the job that he has... They do not allow him. They won't allow him to work without the vaccination. So he's caught between his beliefs, which is not taking vaccinations. And um, I'm just going to quote uh, paraphrase their belief, uh, putting foreign items inside of their body um, versus maintaining my job, you know, and he's caught in that, that, that rock and that hard place area. And there's a lot of people that are in that same boat. Like I work in healthcare. And I have a friend of mine who I helped get a job where I'm at, my full-time job. And he has similar beliefs. And he, he was caught between that rock and a hard place over, do I take this vaccination, something I don't believe in, or do I lose my job, my nine to five, how I provide for myself and my daughter? And it's one of those things, like, I'm not, I can't force my own feelings and my own beliefs on anybody. You know, I have, I had some fears about it, but in the African-American community, let's just be honest, there's a legit fear with medication, especially with what's happened in the past with this, this Absolutely. experiments and so on and so forth. And now we're supposed to trust the same government that's failed us thousands of times over with this piece of medication. And then it now saying, oh, not only do you have to trust us, but you have to take it or else you could lose your job. I look at what's going on in New York with the fire department. The same fire department you fast forward 20 years ago was responding to 9-11 is now being told they're not going to have a job and being villainized if they don't take the vaccination. That's That's a nightmare. That's a rough place to be put in. It's a nightmare. Yeah. it's, It's just a nightmare without any significant help mm-hmm. is one thing for when you mentioned the firefighters the the problems that they went through during 9 11 was a disaster it's one thing for people to say okay hey this is where we this we're here this is where we are right now but what we're willing to do is offer we're going to offer we came up with a financial plan so with a lot of cities are not giving people any significant resources that even if that's the case that will still not put so much pressure on people especially during this time it's the holiday time yeah and it's so funny how why is it around the holiday time all of these different mandates are taking place 
Yeah. Okay. It's, it's rough, so, but at the same time, you get the fear piece, right? Like, yeah. but those mandates are in place. It's legit fear, and and like you said, the holidays are coming. Uh, not only not only are people hosting events at their house, but they're traveling. So you could either catch something while you're out and bring it back and cause damage to your own house or spread something to a loved one. So there's that that fear. And then you, you're finding out there's different life insurance companies that are now not going to do payouts if you died of COVID. And they're saying, oh, if you died of COVID and you could have taken a vaccine, we're not going to do this payout, which caused a whole nother layer of fear. A, and now it goes into how we handle grief, Money. right? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to tell a story of a friend of mine. So I, I have a friend of mine. He uh, he worked, lives in D.C. Years ago, we worked together at the prison. So he wound up contracting COVID. His father also had it. His father was in his last year's uh, of service in the military. Uh, they both went in the hospital center right, around the same time. My friend didn't know his father was in the hospital with it. Uh, his father passed away with it, sadly. Uh, he was in the hospital for, my friend was in the hospital for three or four weeks. Uh, when he was discharged from the hospital, he learned that his father died. And because his father was in the military, the military held on to his body. And he was stationed right outside of Virginia, well, right outside of D.C. and Virginia. So not only did they hold the body, but they were during that time frame, they were doing certain things with COVID-related deaths when it comes to funerals. So he wasn't able to have a traditional funeral. Again, going back to how we're handling this traveling piece, the holiday piece, the fear of contracting this virus, how does that impact us as a people? Well, I can only speak for myself. I come from a people that are resilient. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have overcome so much. I know there are a certain group of people thought that we wouldn't last this long. No. But we're still here. Definitely. I think that this is one of the greatest opportunities in our history to start controlling our own destiny. I think I, like I, I think that um, there was a, one of the one of the term uh, one of the quotes that I heard early on during the pandemic, and I've put it on my heart is "Don't waste the crisis." Now, not everyone's going to be able to come out of it good, understood, but. I look at the three gentlemen that are on this screen. We have influence. We touch lots of people. We have the opportunity not only to change the legacy with our own families, families, but legacies in other families. It's a responsibility, but I signed up for it. My dad signed up for it. If he didn't sign up for it, I probably wouldn't be here. So those of us who can, and, and the mental health piece is very, very important. Actually, uh, I think one of the greatest challenges we have as a people is trauma. I agree. One of the, I think, I think that's, that may be one of the greatest challenges. And I'm not even saying trauma with people we don't look like, trauma with our own, our own, we have trauma with. I've got to the point in my journey that I think that most most black people need a therapist. Yes, that's I true. I think that most most black people need a therapist because you know what? In our bloodlines, we've been going through trauma in our families for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and we haven't addressed it. We have so much trauma that I'm sure both of you gentlemen know people who have family members say, I can't deal with them. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I can't go into business with them. No, I just can't deal with them. The yeah. greatest wealth we have as black people is our family. Yeah. I'm not even talking money. I'm talking the relationships that we have in our family. But that's why that got broken early on. Right. Because they knew that there was power in black family in terms right? of unity. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So when the trauma is within the family, a lot of times it's a mess. But do you think with everything that happened over the last two years, right? Yep. Last year and this year, mm-hmm. do you think that magnified the trauma or do you Absolutely. think it got to a place now where we can address it? No, no. Uh, I think in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. 
I think mm -hmm. in some areas, as Clarence said earlier on, we've buck buckled up, mm -hmm. knuckled. One of my friends says we knuckle up and buckle up. We've done that, but in others, no. I agree. So again, the fact like the trauma is so deep, hits so deep. Like when I see things going on out there and I see someone that's not a man that's not functioning, I ask two or three questions. How where's the father? And how's the family dynamic? A lot but of times then, I, do you think a lot of the father I don't mean to cut you off of my no, no. Dr. Vibe, but in many occasions I've noticed and I, mind you, I'm not just noticing from the professional side. I grew up in, in Westport in the Baltimore Absolutely. area. I grew up in, I, ha I had the blessing of having my, my father at home, but I was like the only family on the block that had a dad at home. So I didn't just have my dad. I had the neighborhood dad. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, and I'm saying and, that I'm sure we all of us probably have dads that weren't biologically our fathers. Mm hmm but they were our fathers. They, the village, for lack of right. a better term, we had the village. But what I was going, where I was going to go at was, with the piece of trauma. Look, there were things I grew up with that was normalized, that was trauma. And I didn't realize how it impacted me until years later, mm -hmm. uh, such as having several friends of mine murdered at an early age. Uh, my trauma. childhood best friend was taken from me. You know, murdered yeah. right in front of his yeah. house. Yeah. And what was normal was, oh well, you drink. Uh, Go to the uh, go over to the bar, uh, ask Joe to buy, buy a drink for you. Give him a couple dollars. He'll go come back with a bottle of Naughty Head, or you get your, get yourself an L and you go smoke or whatever. Right? Um, you cut school. Didn't realize this was self medicating at the time. Mm -hmm. One thing you know is you did this. Everybody around you that you hung out with did this, and everybody everybody in the neighborhood did this. Mm -hmm. And this is something that progressed generationally. So the re um, reason why when you brought up earlier about the trauma piece. I was wondering, have we gotten to a place where this is something that now we realize, oh, we're we're, we're now self-medicating and we're now dealing with this trauma this kind of way. Like I heard this one song somebody was listening to uh, that said, all my friends are dead. And it hit me. It hit me because mm -hmm. like, dude, I was in the same boat. Like my favorite song growing up was, you're nobody till, no, till somebody kills you by Biggie. And I was like, I didn't realize until recently, that's a song about trauma. You know, like at first you go, dude, I relate to this song so much. You don't realize you relate to the song because you relate to the trauma. Right. Well, I, well I'll just add truly to this, that I think that um, we most of us did things younger that we said, what the heck we did this? Why did we do this when we were younger? But we've we have the opportunity to break the curse or break the journey. Mm -hmm. Right. The whole thing, if you know, you know, so we have that opportunity and just to say, I think some of us have advanced, but some of us haven't. Some, unfortunately, during this time, there's some people that are going to advance, some people that are going to stay still, and some people that are going to regress. Uh -huh. let's, let's be real. Like, not everyone's going to come out better, right? So what we have to do is we have to invest in our men. Do not treat our men like they're an expense. We have to invest... Just if anyone does any stock market trading, when you invest in a stock over time, a lot of times it grows. You just can't piecemeal and go. You can't, you have, we have to, we have to sit down with our men. And one of the questions I ask a man when I first meet him is, what would you do if you couldn't fail? And the reason why I ask that, because with many black men, they have a goal, dream, and desire that they've given up on. And we need to reignite their dream, goal, and desire so they can be better for themselves, better for their family, better for the community, better for the world. And we have and we have to realize that when we're better, we not only help ourselves, which is great, but we're also helping the world. How do you think women or just a man's partner can help support them with that? Ask them. And again, it depends if the man's ready for it, but ask him. Tell me your story. When I sit down for a man for the first time, that's one of the first questions I ask him. Tell me your story. What's, you know, what, did, what was life growing up like, et cetera. Sometimes it's two to three hours long. But you know what? They feel appreciated and someone's asked them how they're doing.
what, what's so, been going on? Go ahead, so, Clarence. It's so funny that you just said that. I'm actually uh, working on a book and uh, it should be out by the holiday time. But no, you actually nailed it. It's um, there's a big disconnect. No one communicates. Can we have communication issues? Uh, people don't communicate. People don't express. It's like, unfortunately, we live in a world that has become like code and people are numb. So he's 100 percent right. Yes, yes. You, you, he's 100 percent right. Like just having conversations, communicating, yeah. expressing things. And no one is talking. Nobody right. talks. Every, everybody is posting. Like nobody, every just to add on what Clarence is saying is one of the regular practices I do is every week I pick three random guys and I'll either call them or I'll send them a text message, two words. You good? That's it. You good. That's it. Don't have to be complex. That's it. Just just check in on them. How you doing? And I don't want to hear about your job because your job should not yeah. define you. Yes. So I I realized we touched the core with the with the nobody's talking piece, the communication piece, right? Do you think the George Floyd incident that happened, right? Like with the video and how it blew up, do mm -hmm. you think that kind of created a dialogue over the trauma that we didn't even that we've normalized, right? Because I remember I got my first car when I was 16, 16 mm -hmm. or 17 years old. And I remember going out. And being pulled over by police off over Washington Boulevard, they searched my car. I had just bought this car at a white Mirage. And I had uh, the unmarked police officers and some of the other uh, regular marked police officers pull me over. They searched my car. Like, I just came out of McDonald's on Washington Boulevard. And I'm just eating chicken nuggets. Like, dude, what did I do? You know, they had, they maced me, pulled me out the car, take a knife, cut up my seats, cut up the carpet in my car, search for whatever they search for. My job maced on the side of the road. And they find nothing, boom, 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 close my doors back. They hop in that car. They drive off. Still a high school student, so all my books all over the ground, everything, right? And I remember just sitting there like, dude, I can't see. It's this orange stuff all over my eyes because, like, they maced me pretty hard and then pulled me out the car. And I'm like, dude, I can't even see. And I get, I make it home, talk to my pops about it. And then he has the conversation with me about how to deal with police when you're getting pulled over. Like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. One thing I asked was, what did I do? And I handed my license registration, right? But that's a piece of the trauma. And it, it just kept going on and on, right? Um, and I could tell about how I had the SWAT team called, called on me for getting money from out of the bank once and all kind of ridiculous foolishness, right? And all those things add to trauma. And, you know, you work around some people who might not look like you and, yep. you you know, some kind of way stories come up and they don't believe you. Right. That didn't happen. Like, it's impossible for that to happen. Right. And then this George Floyd thing happens and they come back to you because now they remember like what? Oh, my God, this is what happened. And it creates a dialogue. Does Do anybody else feel like this created a dialogue with other people that might not look like you or other people that do look like you to can I answer that real quick? Yeah. I definitely created a dialogue, but it also created a lot of BS too. Excuse my language, mm -hmm. but I'm no, just go for it. It, real. Um, it created a lot of BS because when George Floyd happened, if you notice, a lot of big companies and systems started to promote these fake commercials. They started to do all of this stuff like publicly. Oh, we're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing that. And yeah, we it was some change, you know, and things like that. But Unfortunately, in the United States, you have these big corporations always trying to capitalize off of things. And then they really have no true intentions on working to fix anything. So once that once it dies down, everything goes with it. Mm -hmm. Nothing continues. It's like, OK, the commercials of sympathy are gone. Now. You have all of these different things that just go away once the problem is no longer on the front of CNN. So. It's like we some it has to be real work done. It has to be real change. Things have to really that someone has to genuinely want to see change or fix things. Other than that, like with George Floyd, yeah, we saw a lot, but 
it was also a lot of companies capitalizing off of his death. I'll just add on with the clearance because I see time's running down here. What needs to happen is a long term commitment. Bingo. That's what needs to happen. Commercials come and go and all that. I know many people who look like us who are appointed DNI, head of diversity and inclusion in their organizations, and they're the only person there. They're not getting any support. So on the outside, it looks good. We've got a DNI person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But are you giving them the resources, the opportunity, and the tools to be successful to make real change? This is not a short term game. No. It took hundreds of years for it to get to where it is. Are the companies willing to make a long term investment, not just financially, but company wise, to a long term change? If they're Who just do doing think? it for, they're just doing it for, a quarter or a few years, like a three or four years, by in three or four years time, something else is going to happen. And also too, let's be real. I know in your country, blacks are not the major minority anymore. Latino Americans are. So we live in my opinion, a capitalistic democracy. Mm -hmm. So whatever is advantageous capitalist wise, that's who they're going to go to or where they're going to show their energies. Just a thought. <laughs> You're spot on right. Let, let me ask you this. Who do you think holds the charge or the responsibility of that commitment? Uh, making sure that, let's say, these uh, REI committees, these race... DNI? Uh, the yeah. Like, I, I think the, respons I think are the are responsibility with it is us mm -hmm. because we've got to hold them accountable. Because if we don't hold them accountable, no change is going to happen. So it's it's got to be us. Because really and truly, they can say they can be accountable, but if they're not and we don't hold them, they'll say, hey, they're not serious. We could get by for doing this for a few years. And we're not going to, we've got to hold, we have, to, we hold our own future. We've got to control our narrative. So what advice, let me ask you, I, I, I think you say we were wrapping up soon. Mm -hmm. Um what advice can you give people who are just tired mm. and may not have the energy yep. and the strength to even hold anyone accountable? Okay. Because just like we talked about a few minutes ago, they we've been going through so many different changes for so many years and overcoming different obstacles. Yep. What kind of advice can you give that would, maybe change people's perspective okay. on exactly what you just mentioned, where maybe they could find a new, some energy or okay. a fresh look on it to, to, to find the strength to go after and hold people accountable. Because some people are just tired. Yeah, I, and I hear you. And sometimes I get tired too. Mm -hmm. I get tired. Yeah. So these are, these are some of the things I would suggest. First of all, taking a break is part of the process. Yep. Right? No race car driver who wins a race, most of the time they have to go in for a pit stop. Right? Indianapolis 500, they go in for a pit stop. They get their tires changed. They get their oil changed, et cetera. Plus, they have a team. They have a pit crew. So one of the things I would say great for black men's mental health, if you can. Well, first of all, it all starts with you. You want to change. It has to start with you. No one can make you change, as Kyle said earlier. Then I really encourage every Black man have two or three other Black men that know everything good about you and everything bad about you. Because you're going to have those moments in your journey that you're going to be on the bottom. And let me tell you, if you don't have no one out to reach to, it's not a fun moment. And it has to be reciprocal relationships. Reciprocal. I also say to our Black men, no Black man has a bad day. He may have some bad moments, but he doesn't have a bad day. Another thing I would just say is that every Black man has value. Every Black man has value. And we need to just work on being a little bit better each 
day. And then the last thing I would say is a concept that one of my mentors shared with me. Again, some men may be ready to do this, some men may not, but it's a concept called a living eulogy. And people say living eulogy doesn't make sense. We can't say what we really mean to another black man. If we're two black men in a relationship, we can't wait till they die. We have to say our love to them while they're still alive. Yes. Because those things can make a black man say, you know what? I can't quit. I'm appreciated. I'm loved. It also, it starts, has to start from them first. But if people know and feel that they're loved, that provides an opportunity for that black man to move forward. It's not a short-term journey. And even if it was, we'd still find something to complain about. And some of us would still mess up. But mm -hmm. we have to realize that when we work together, we win together. And that includes our women too. And hey, some of us aren't perfect. Got it. But you know what? There are many of us that are, and we need you. And hey, we're not perfect. And hey, you may not know some of our backgrounds. If you know some of our backgrounds, you may realize, oh, that's why he is. Make work with, work with each other, not repel, work with. Takes time. I'm complete. Oh, Clarence, I was going to let you go ahead because I know we're coming up on time. No, I'm the doctor. Uh, that was that was really cool. No, I, yeah. I that was exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, because it's just like, man, people are just tired out here. You oh, know? yeah, tired. It's, not, it's not that people we have all of these silly stigmas like, oh, black men are lazy. This, no, 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 no. People tired. Mm -hmm. We're tired of fighting, we're tired <laughs> of fighting. Right. We need we need. And I want to encourage our men take a break if you have to, please. And thank you. Be intentional. Take make time in your day, 15, 20 minutes. Just take some time to just be in yourself. Be quiet. Be quiet just with yourself and get and just have that time, because the better you are to yourself, the better you're going to be for others. And it's so, so that investment. And again, Kyle said, we didn't get a chance. There's not a lot of black male mental health practitioners out there. So we need to find ways of getting more representation in that area. Even if it's in coaching, let alone coaching, there's a difference between mental health practitioners and coaches, but even black male coaches can be helpful in this situation. Yeah. And Roger, I found this career by mistake. <laughs> Like I, I'm it wasn't a mistake. Totally, but, it was meant to no, happen. I, I, nothing I wasn't looking nothing for just this. happens. Like I was trying to find a job. I was working at a hospital. I see a lady on the elevator. I see how she's dressed. And I realize she's not a doctor or a nurse. I'm like, yo, what do you do here? And she tells me she's a social worker. I'm like, what's that? You know, because I went to college beforehand. I didn't. I went, my thought was, and mind you, my small worldview at the time, the only jobs that were available um, that was professional was school teacher police officer which i was never going to be and no no knock to any police officer just wasn't for me um and they the time came I used after to me to be a police officer rap. i said no thank you yeah and i worked in the prison for five years like i can't do it you know and the only reason why i survived that long was i had car payments <laughs> just being trans <laughs> just being transparent <laughs> you know and i i, I received like I, I the lady told me what to do i went did it I jumped in this field and realized, oh my gosh, I'm the only black fish in this pond. The only black male fish in this pond. And I just kept going from there and I've been blessed to be where I'm at, you know? And I tell everybody, hey, look, look into this. If you're looking for something to do, look into this. We need you. There you go. This has been an amazing conversation. I felt like I was a fly on the wall at the barber shop or <laughs> you know, at the at the sports arena where the the, the women weren't necessarily present. The information and wisdom that you all shared is invaluable. Um, and I am going to ask now that we're going to be doing a part two. Um, I've been receiving text messages and notes. Um, Dr. Vibe, I've been asked to have you repeat the quote that you started with. Oh, okay. Let me pull it up. 
Let me pull it up. Let me just pull it up here. Give me a second. Uh, okay. Let me pull it up here. Okay. So here's a quote again. Being a black man in America means being my brother's keeper. Being a black man in America means being my brother's keeper while keeping a distance from my brother because I don't trust him further than I can see him. Mm. Trauma. That's trauma right there. It's believing the cops don't care about you. It's learning how not to doubt yourself because when you're born, everyone else does. So if anyone wants, uh, Corinthia has my email address. I can certainly share that quote with you. And uh, if anyone wants to, to, to chat, I know I'm available. This is what I do. Thank you. And can you plug the name of your show again? And uh, uh, well, the, the, doc, the, the doctor, if you look in the the doctor vibe show right there, I've done over 3000 online conversations and I host four or five shows every week. One of them being uh, dad's talking and black men talking, which is a global conversation with, with men. So uh, thank you. And uh, one last thing I will say to people in sign language, this means love. I love you. And then when you do this, it means love you too. Love you too. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, can Clarence Thank plug you. his book before we go? Later. Um, and for those who haven't registered for the VIP meet and greet, you will have an opportunity to continue this conversation and ask questions of the panelists um, immediately following the last panel. Thank you so much. Give yourselves grace. Goodbye. Bye-bye.